Thank you for joining us for AMCA's Nostos and, and uh, Citizenship for Hellenic Adoptees webinar panel discussion. My name is Luke Katsos, and I will be moderating today's discussion. A distinguished panel includes author Professor Gonda Van Steen, the uh, Korais Chair in the Center for Hellenic Studies in the Department of Classics at King's College, AHEPA's uh, Supreme Vice President, Chris Kateson, a journalist uh, and uh, editor of the uh, shipping and finance uh, uh, newspaper, Petros Diplas. And also uh, my show is uh, at the Voice of Greece also. Yes, and, and we'll, uh, we'll introduce uh, uh, you later. Uh, uh, we'll introduce you later and we'll, okay. tell, we'll, we'll, we'll give you all the details of that. Okay. Katerina Bakoyan, co-founder of Melon Media, uh, head of podcasts, Alter Ego Media, and author, uh, Dr. Mary Cardaris, director at the Demo Center in Athens. In the Hellenic diaspora, Nostos, the return and or homecoming of a hero manifests as a dual pole, the gravitational force of the adopted land and the magnetic allure of the ancestral home. The tension between assimilation and the preservation of one's cultural heritage creates a profound sense of displacement. Navigating this duality Individuals in the diaspora grapple with questions of belonging and authenticity. Nowhere is this feeling more profound than among Hellenic adoptees, about 4,000, who were ripped from the root, from their nation of birth, Elas, in the years after World War II and sent to live with strangers in the US and Western Europe. Within the Greek diaspora, for the Hellenic adoptees, the concept of nostos takes on a distinct hue as many individuals yearn not only for the return of their ancestral homeland, but also for a formal reconnection through Greek citizenship. This dual longing encapsulates a complex interplay of identity, cultural ties, and the desire for legal recognition. For most adoptees in the Hellenic diaspora, the yearning for Greek citizenship becomes a tangible manifestation of their connection to Greece. It, repre it represents a bridge between the adopted land and the ancestral roots, forging a legal and symbolic link to a shared heritage. This aspiration embodies a profound sense of belonging, a quest to participate fully in the cultural and civic life of Greece. The pursuit of Greek citizenship within the diaspora is often intertwined with a deeper exploration of identity. It reflects not just a legal status, but a commitment to preserving and perpetuating Hellenic culture, language, and traditions across generations. For most Hellenes in the diaspora, the process of obtaining Hellenic citizenship even though it is guaranteed within the Hellenic constitution since its adoption, it has been and can be daunting, complex, and very time consuming and very problematic or impossible for Hellenic adoptees for a number of reasons. Thank you for joining us as we explore in this discussion, the problems around citizenship for Hellenic adoptees and solutions to a historic and shameful travesty. I'm happy also to tell the audience that, uh, that the uh, Nostos for Greek uh, Born Adoptees petition has exceeded over 37,000 signatures to date. So that's a, that's a tremendous accomplishment. So we're gonna start our panel discussion now and I'm going to introduce uh, the various panelists for just brief presentations before we, uh, we uh, have our uh, general uh, discussion amongst ourselves. Our first panelists, uh, you know very well, because we've discussed this topic, I think, Gonda, four times. I think we started the first time when we were doing uh, a few years ago, uh, leading up to the Hellenic Revolution, we did a, a program relating to a, to a, to a adoptees and, and uh, uh, from the time of the revolution into, into modern times, and you were, you were a part of that. And then we have done a few other ones. So this is the fourth. So this is uh, exciting for us. 
Gonda, van, uh, Gonda holds the Kodais Chair of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, Language and Literature at the Department of Classics at King's College, London. She is the author of five books, Venom and Verse, Aristophanes in Modern Greece, Liberating Hellenism uh, from the Ottoman Empire, Theater of the Condemned, Classical Tragedy on Greek Prison Islands, and Stage of Emergency, Theater and Public Performance under the Greek Military Dictatorship of 1967 to 1974. Her latest book, Adoption, Memory, and Cold War Greece, which came out in 2019, takes the reader into the uncharted terrain of Greek adoption stories that become paradigmatic of Cold War politics and history. She most recently uh, published an edited volume entitled The Battle of Bodies, Hearts and Minds in Postwar Greece. Social worker Charles Skimmerhorn in Thessaloniki, 1946 to 1951. She takes a keen interest in transnational collaborations and study abroad programs. Welcome, Gonda. Thank you for being with us today. Well, thank you so much, Lou. I'm very grateful because you have literally been with us from the very first day. You've seen every phase of this campaign. So I'm particularly grateful to you for hosting us and also for allowing us to speak with these valuable participants, some of whom I'm getting to know better and better. I appreciate Chris, Petros, Mary, and Katerina being here. I'm very grateful. I'm first of all a teacher, so I have a, a little PowerPoint presentation to get you through slightly more technical stuff, but bear with me. I'm going to share it. And we are right on it. So um, I want to speak about new developments because there are the older MK panels, panels where you can see our previous dialogue, which I don't need to repeat. But I want to say that certain new developments are exciting, and I want to speak in very positive terms about those, and I'll explain why they are uh, indeed a very positive development. We have been asked for input on the anticipated revisions of the Greek Nationality Code, which is scheduled to be to enter an, a more intense phase of debate in April. That's good news because in the current nationality code, there is no provision for the historic adoptees, historic in inverted commas, because these adoptees, as you know, are alive and well, and we are very well networked and we talk to each other every single day. So there is clearly an increasing demand, a more vocal demand, uh, a very specific specific, very targeted advocacy to which Mary will be speaking. There is also heightened expertise, and we hope that it will meet increased political will. So what has changed from a discussion that went something like uh, well, the citizenship code doesn't really say anything about adoptees from the 50s and 60s. The question is now, what would work for these adoptees of the 50s and 60s? A question that has literally come to me, and I'm very grateful that we're entering in that kind of discussion. What could we do to cover all of them? If we can't cover all of them with a path forward, can we at least make the process easier for 80% of them? And look, we're never going to have a full scale measure for all of them, but we're all in agreement that if we can get 80% over the finish line, then the remaining 20% will follow. So I also want to quantify the numbers in a more specific targeted way in relation to the citizenship issue. Yes, 4,000 Greek children were sent to the USA in the 50s and 60s, and another 600 to the Netherlands, but they're a different case. Of those 4,000, not everyone is seeking citizenship. I would say only about 500 to 700 are seeking citizenship as a second or dual citizenship. It, and again, it would be wrong to call these cases historic, but yes, because they're older than many other adoptee cases, we would hope that they certainly have a certain priority. The Dutch cases, the Swedish cases, and certain a few a sprinkling of cases to Britain, Australia, Cyprus, um, are typically of adoptees born in the 60s. There's a slightly more time there, but uh, the rules can be different for countries within the EU, such as the Netherlands. I don't want to go into that. Now, 
it is debatable whether the adoptees sent to the U.S., the Greek-born adoptees sent to the, to the U.S., actually lost their citizenship. Lost is a heavy word. Um, it's certainly, well, it's actually technically not lost, but hasn't been found either. And, you know, uh, if it's not lost, one would hope it can easily be found. That's not the case. The language that the official office in Greece uses na na epanaktisun na anaktisun i na epanaktisun to reacquire or acquire. I like the word to reacquire, but is because it is indeed an acknowledgement that these adoptees would at some point have had Greek citizenship, and we want to keep that clearly in mind that these people left Greece as Greek citizenship citizens. So, formally. The question used to be, do these adoptees have a Greek birth certificate? Because in Greece, the prevailing principle is the principle of descent, of the bloodline. You have to prove that you are descending of a Greek citizen. And I mean, there are other ways, such as proving your general Greekness, but the, the main, the bulk of the people will get through on the basis of descent, bloodline. In, in technical language, that is... You know, thanks to the Romans, the use sanguinis, as opposed to what we in America know as the as the principle of being born in American territory that makes you a citizen, which is a very generous concept, come to think of it. Being born here in the US clears you no matter what your parents were in terms of nationality. But Greece holds on to that principle of bloodline. That, of course, uh, uh, raises the very difficult question that many of these people adopted out from Greece to the US in the 1950s are foundlings. Foundlings, meaning, are they going to prove that they are descendant of a Greek citizen? So in, immediately we kind of find ourselves in front of that big black hole that is the demand to prove your descent. That has typically, that the man to prove your descent has typically been the first questions raised. But it is for the Greek adoptees a little bit like beating a dead horse. If you don't have that birth certificate showing descent, or if you don't have a birth certificate at all, which is very common, not having one at all, then no matter what you dig up, you're never going to prove that line of descent. So the conversation has shifted to what documents then do the adoptees actually have? So it's a little bit a flipping of the script, not emphasizing, oh, you don't have this, but what do you have? And, and is there at least, or at least that's what we advocate, is there at least a possibility to give equal weight to what you have as we would normally give to that birth certificate? So... One thing that we need to keep in mind is that when you were a foundling in Greece in, let's say, 1950, very common, you, you, you get issued a paper that actually says Praxi Genesios, birth certificate, but it is not a birth certificate. It's a foundling registration, meaning you are found, therefore you exist. But you are found doesn't mean therefore you exist as a Greek citizen. Big difference. Right. So, so is it a birth certificate? Technically, it has the title of a birth certificate, but it doesn't give you any birth data. So it's not comparable to any other birth certificate where a mother would be listed in a hospital and a date and a time. It's a foundling registration going under the label of birth certificate, but without any birth data. And in that respect, for that question of descent, it's actually pretty useless. So. Let's do a little comparison here. Let's do a tiny bit of a comparison between where the normal applicant of Greek descent uh, has an advantage over the adoptee applicant of 100% Greek descent who hasn't had that recognized yet. Your average applicant will have a birth certificate, or at least his father or grandfather will hopefully have a birth certificate or some other form of official registration. For the adoptee applicant, in many cases, that doesn't apply. I, I put that in red, right? The average applicant, or some of their ancestors, will be registered on that notorious family portion. For the adoptee, many of whom are illegitimate children, that was certainly not going to happen because there is no acknowledgement of the illegitimate child in the 1950s. The average applicant of Greek descent also has cultural advantages, such as, you know, whole network of parents and cousins and uncles who can assist a good number of them are in Greece, uh, you know, some knowledge of Greek to help negotiate the process. 
of our adoptee applicants, many went to families with no Greek connection, so they're clearly at a cultural historical disadvantage. So on this kind of first approach, with the mindset of descent, with the mindset of the bloodline, the adoptee applicant really loses out big time. The, 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 the answer is immediately no to all these otherwise very pertinent questions. So if we flip the script then and focus on what the adoptee then actually have, then we can start thinking positively about this process. Here's what the adoptee have. And again, I'm talking about 80%, right? They have an adoption act, people, from the Greek law court, the Protodikio, and about, I would say about 70% of these adoption acts went through Athens or through major cities like Thessaloniki and Heraklion. In Athens, they're preserved, they are uh, stored in the general state archives, they are even readily accessible. They haven't been moved and they haven't been dusted for the past 70 years. This is perfect, because that also means they haven't been tampered with. So we can totally and utterly trust the Adoption Act. Great. They also, these adoptees, mostly traveled with a Greek passport. I say mostly because some got lost, you know, uh, uh, or, or adoptive parents didn't save all, all the papers. So between an adoption act and a Greek passport, those are two firm acknowledgments that the Greek state of the 1950s issued paperwork on behalf of their wards, their charges, their children, as Greek adoptees. Yes, they took charge of these Greek-born children, but they took charge of them at the very moment that, oh, there's no way to put this nicely, that they were being prepared for export. Let me put it like that, okay? But clearly there is a last minute in extremist acknowledgement through the Adoption Act, through an official court, through a passport, through the Ministry of the uh, Exterior, Interior, uh, that these people leave the country as Greek citizens. That's very important because we need to go back there. And then if you want to look at the positive things coming from the US side, you will see that these adoptive parents file for naturalization. You have to state and prove the original nationality, Greek, so they gather up everything that is Greek, more evidence right there. Some Adoptions were handled through the International Social Service. That is good luck from an archival perspective. The International Social Service has preserved every single file since 1953. Very few people from the 50s would have 150 pages dedicated to them. If you are an adoptee that came through the International Social Service, there are between 15 and 150 pages dedicated to your case. That is just incredible if you think about it as a source of evidence. And then I want to make a case also for all sorts of additional evidence. People in, appear in newspapers of arrival. You know, the local newspapers are all getting excited about little Greek orphan arriving in Midland, Texas kind of thing. Uh, there is flight information. There is correspondence between the adoptive parents and the lawyer or the institution. Uh, there is clearly a lot of kind of secondary or additional, uh, additional evidence that can go in this package. And of course, there could be DNA testing in a controlled environment, and we're not quite there yet for a court to allow the DNA testing, but clearly one day we'll have to go there. So clearly now we're at a page full of positive material that can support the adoptee's case, but it's the kind of material that until now has not received as much weight as that elusive Greek birth certificate. So I want to take you to a Greek Adoption Act just to prove it to you, uh, I've taken the names off, but what the Greek Adoption Act of the 50s and 60s does for you is it checks with the receiving state whether the laws of adoption of, let's say, Texas or Colorado are in accordance with the Greek law of adoption because it says... It's, this is relevant to to io te tumeno e continelliniki italiana to the adopted child that has the Greek nationality. So the Greek Adoption Act makes a clear point of saying we're only checking the applicability of whatever country's law or whatever American state's law because we're dealing with a child that has the Greek nationality, and therefore we need a law that is not in contradiction or not offensive to the Greek adoption law, so that we can. 
let our own Greek citizen child go to an, a country state with an adoption law that is not uh, ethically or morally offensive to the Greek law. So what clearer indication that the Greek state takes charge and even takes pride and even fights for the privilege of adopting its own child citizens. And, and does that, not as some sort of an, a private matter, but does that systematically. And on the basis of this, I wanna argue that an adoption act passed by any proto dikio any court of first instance in Greece, clearly minds the mindset, taps into the mindset of the time that says that the Greek state insists on doing the adoptions of its own Greek citizens, which for me, whatever the details of the laws are, is an indication of an acknowledgement of the Greek citizenship status of the child at the moment of the child leaving the country. So, so, of course, there will always be the adoptees who have lost everything and, and or, you know, the immigration file is lost in Missouri. There, there are lots of special circumstances. We understand that. We feel that at least these people should be given the opportunity to enter into a dialogue. And, and the process of approaching the consulate, the process of approaching the embassy, the offices is very difficult. It, it's it's very difficult to even get a personalized answer. Hopefully that can change and change for everyone, not just for the adoptees. One should at least be able to explain why a key document is missing, why a passport is missing, but you have the Adoption Act, or why you, know, you have everything else, but not this. But look, here is all the secondary evidence. It would be wonderful that for the people who have a special case to make, there would be a pathway to a facilitated process, expedited process, because we're running out of time, that, that lets them argue their case. In the same way that you have to go and argue your case if you apply for citizenship under the Greekness factor, right? And, and so I could easily see that with a few people assisting here, with a committee assisting here, somebody who understands this from a legal perspective, somebody understands this from an, an, an um, academic, scholarly perspective, historical perspective, somebody who understands it also from an emotional perspective, from a Greek adoptee perspective, because there is emotion involved here. I, I argue for a platform of people being allowed to make their case. So I'm going to sum this up in language that we can all hopefully agree to. The Greek citizenship code that currently applies to the Greek adoptees born in the 50s and the 60s is that at least one of the biological parents must be Greek. If, you're, if you have the name of an unwed mother, you're good if it says that she's a Greek citizen, but still not easy. Foundling children of unknown parents cannot prove that fact that they're born of at least one Greek parent. For these foundlings, it should suffice that the Greek state stepped in back then with the legal authority to issue them an adoption decree and a passport, clear indications that the Greek state acknowledged their citizenship. So today, instead of insisting on seeing the name of a Greek birth mother that may never be found, the Greek adoption decree and the passport should hold the same weight as that is an elusive Greek birth certificate. And what that actually means is arguing for a little bit of an extension of that strict law of bloodlines. If you're found in Patras in 1953, very common, Honestly, what else are you going to be then Greek, right? I mean, it, you, this should almost be like a default argument being there. If you're literally less than 24 hours old in 53 in Patras, I think you're Greek. What else? So this should clearly be a mindset that is a little more willing to, to, to acknowledge that people uh, even if they're few days old, that they're still born of a Greek citizen, even if that Greek citizen cannot be identified. And in the law, in the later law of foundlings, a state will have to acknowledge that you have the nationality of the territory when you're, where you're found, if no other nationality uh, uh, can be documented, let's say. I also want to refer you to new material. There is, would you believe it, a book dedicated to getting your Greek citizenship by descent. Came out just a few months ago uh, by a woman who's not of Greek descent in Australia, Guide to Your Greek Citizenship by Descent. It's a, um, 
a valuable resource to help you think it through, but also to help you write letters. How do you write to the demos? How do you request? How do you even phrase it? What do you even ask for? How do you use the technical language? So if you're going for your Greek citizenship, my advice is it's going to cost you a little bit of money anyway. Invest at least in a book as well. It's it's always a good investment to educate yourself as far as possible. And I also want to refer you to this video on YouTube, which you can click afterwards, which is by Katerina Uli, who is active and a leading figure in the citizenship office in Athens. She gave this presentation targeted to the Greek-born adoptees in September 23. It's still very re recent, and she, in, indeed, you can in tell from the way she phrases it that she is ready to, you know, to meet the requests of some 500 to 700 people who are indeed not only very deserving of their Greek citizenship, but I would say right now probably one of the most dynamic um, actors in the Greek diaspora. That's all for me. Thank you. Uh, Gonda, thank thank you thank you so much for that. It was uh, very enlightening, very interesting. You know, I I, I you know, I'm not going to go into my feelings right now, but I think I think uh, there's a lot of excuses that uh, people make up, and you have all the logic there, and it's almost impossible to to comprehend how the logic is not translated into just accepting it and proceeding to process it. Uh, we'll go further into the questioning when we're talking when we're talking to each other. Uh, but I will say, you, you mentioned the issues of the consulates and things like that. I do know something about the consulate, let's say, in New York, for example. Right now, they're not accepting any phone calls by anybody. Uh, you can't go online right now and register for anything. They tell you, we're all booked up until May. But meanwhile, if you go online and you say, I want to do a thing after, after May, well, it's not, it's not uh, right now online, so you can't do anything. Um, I think there's a lot of big runaround, and this is a, a big, big issue. But let me let me stop there because I want to introduce our next um, presenter, and it's Chris uh, uh, Kaitsan. He was born in 1956 in Levadi, uh, Arcadia, in Greece, and adopted at age two, and raised in a small town in Indiana. He has met his birth family and vacationed with them in the U.S. and in Greece. He currently serves as the Supreme Vice President of AHEPA. Prior to his retirement in uh, 2018, he served as the U.S. General Counsel for Enbridge Energy. <clears throat> he has served on numerous charities and boards during his career. I'll just mention some of them and as many, and as many more. Uh, he was involved, obviously, with the Houston uh, Alley Theater, the Houston Ballet. He was involved with his uh, law school board. Uh, he was the past president of the Annunciation Greek Orthodox Cathedral in, uh, in Houston, Texas. Uh, he served also as a, a chairman for the various Greek festivals that they've had there. He has served on numerous uh, AHEPA boards. Uh, the American uh, Heart Association's Lawyers Have Heart is one of, the, one of the activities that he's had. And the United Way Law Firm Initiative uh, chairman. He has been married for 44 years and has two children. His hobbies include skydiving, my God, skydiving, <laughs> uh, scuba diving, sports, uh, beach, and travel. Thank you, Chris, for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you, Lou. I'm honored to be a part of this uh, wonderful panel. The, the expertise is on here are just amazing. So I don't bring the expertise that everyone else has. I have a little more on the uh, practical side. I'm going to talk about the high side of the uh, uh, citizenship process, the uh, desire to do it, the low side of whether you want to do it or not. So um, my factual situation is a little unique. Uh, well, let me start with, I was born in 56, but I also have a, a sister born from the same parents in 54, so two years older than, than myself. I was adopted by a family in Indiana at the age of two. Ten years later, she was adopted by the same family in Indiana. So for 10 years, we were separated. She continued to live in the same Hurigo where I, where I, I, I was born and raised. Uh, so we do have a uniquely different, oh gosh, uh, speaking. Her, she has a very strong Greek accent. Um, she's had many, many more illnesses uh, from malnutrition and the challenges that went through uh, growing up during that time period, um, and just on and on. So Lou hit on a couple of things that I was going to talk about, uh, the challenge of... Uh, actually getting your documents in front of anyone. 
Uh, I'm hearing the same stories, May at the earliest for current documents. So, so my process uh, goes back to the first time I went to Greece after being adopted, it was at the age of 18. And my birth, my adopted parents went back and took the whole family. And actually we met my then uh, birth father. My mother passed shortly after I was born. And that was part of the reason I was put up for adoption. And that was a very strenuous situation. Uh, you've got two, two sets of families, basically two sets of parents that somewhat get along, somewhat don't. Uh, but from the standpoint of how I knew all of this, when I was adopted, they sewed a letter inside the uh, jacket that I had. So I actually have a letter from when I was two years old that explains where I came from, the family circumstances. So my, my adopted parents knew the history from day one. Uh, therefore, they kept contact with folks in Greece, though I didn't. And they knew when my sister was being put up for adoption, they knew to actually challenge the process for her to be adopted by a family uh, somewhere else, because they then were uh, financially able to adopt a second child, which they probably would not have done if they did not know that I had a birth sister back in Greece. So we united um, at, a, at a young age and grew up together. So the, the one trip back to Greece uh, before the military uh, threat, I guess, of being required to serve in the military if you go to Greece. I was a little concerned about that. So going back to the age of 18, I was under the age of 19. Um, as I was told by my adoptive parents, I should not worry about being uh, retained in Greece to serve in the military at that point in time. It was an interesting trip. I, I think I mentioned the strain, strain that goes with uh, both sides of the family interacting, a uh, little resentment, a little uh, guilt on both sides from that standpoint. We were only there one day. So that was my interaction, my introduction to my birth father who remarried, uh, had two children from his second uh, second wife that are half sisters and half brother that are each uh, uh, just two or three years younger than, than myself. So age-wise, we're comparable. Got a chance to see them, say hello. They spoke very little English and I spoke very little Greek, so there wasn't a great amount of interaction. So we come back to the States, and for the next uh, 30 years, basically, I kind of forget about Greece. Um, why? Well, I wasn't totally comfortable with the situation that I was in when I when I went to Levithi. It was a very uncomfortable situation. Um, the language barrier was definitely a problem, okay, that we couldn't communicate as well and express our feelings as, as well. So then the question is, do I really want to be a Greek citizen? Do I want to pursue this? Do I want to get to know my family? And those are the decisions that an adoptee uh, has to make. There are pluses and minuses to all that, and there's plenty of great material out there on, on whether to do that or not. At that stage of my life, I, I pretty much decided I don't want to. So for for lots of reasons, but the language for one, uh, did not have any experience growing up. There wasn't a close bond for a one day meeting. And then over the course of the next few years, my, my adopted uh, father died and then my adopted mother died. So at the age of 45, I decided that I want to pursue meeting my birth family and getting acquainted and, and uh, reevaluate the decision of whether I was interested in citizenship or not, interested in establishing a, a rapport, a relationship with them. So we took the family, went to Greece, um, and we spent about four or five days in Greece. And uh, interesting, the first trip to my Horio, I was asked about the trip over to Greece, and they said, uh, uh, "We said I told them we stopped in London, uh, and they said, well, how long were you in London? And I said, Tris uh, Metis. And they said, oh, you don't speak Greek very well. You don't know what you're saying. So I had to wait until my sister came back in to explain to them that, oh, we really did, or I'm sorry, my wife came in. Um, and explained to them, we really did stop three days. And they were like, why? Uh, why would you not come immediately to Greece, immediately to Horio, immediately to meet your family? We're going a great distance. Uh, so tried to explain all that. I was blessed because my wife is fluent in Greek. She uh, attended Greek school, graduated from Greek school in Houston, Texas. So I had a lot more comfort in communication process when we we're back in Greece at this age. Um, I still wasn't convinced that I really had an interest in in uh, establishing citizenship, when I continue to do this, um, I was not raised speaking Greek in the, in the home. I, we did not raise our children speaking Greek. We forced them to go to Greek school for a couple of years, that battle that uh, we finally gave up on. So even at this stage, um, I still had uncertainty. 
But why did I pursue this? Because I think it's important for folks to know their nationality, to know their background, to know what kind of uh, medical condition you have, uh, what, what uh, uh, you know, the, the pluses and minuses of, of the, the heritage that you have. And it's always a good thing to meet new people. I mean, I, I, I continue to do that. Even my current position is to happen. Almost every weekend, I'm going to different cities and meeting new people. So this was this was one of those, but I had a distinct interest in in getting to know them a little more. We had a great rapport, but we 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 only went about every other year. Had a great relationship. We brought them to the the states. They spent uh, um, my adopted. I'm sorry, my birth father and his wife. Uh, we brought them to the states. They spent a month with uh, my sister and I at different locations. Um, and everything was great. We brought over my uh, half sister uh, and her family. They've been over and stayed with us. We've been over there many, many times. But I still wasn't convinced that that uh, establishing a Greek rapport and having Greek citizenship and and having that relationship was really something in the long term that was a benefit to me. It was nice to have, but there are a lot of places in the world to go visit, and places to go see. Do I really want to go to Greece every year or every other year? Uh, there actually is a burden that goes with that. And despite what people may say or think, if you go to Greece, there's an obligation on your part, guilt, if you will, um, to go see family. And you have limited vacation as you're growing up. Do you really want to force your children to go through that? Um, yes. So we did for, for quite a bit of time. But because of that limited interaction with the, uh, the family in Greece, um, and by limited, I'm talking about just we don't see them that often, don't talk to them that often, and still the language barrier um, there were there were events that occurred over the course of time that things that were said that were harm, har, hurtful. Uh, and I'm a firm believer that when a discussion is going on and someone says something in a quick manner, those are real thoughts and feelings that they have. I think we hold back and, and we try to consciously think what we're going to say in situations. And when sm someone speaks very quickly and says something like that, like, then he said, Topidimo. Uh, you're not my son, that those are the true feelings that someone has. And I did hear that at one at one stage, and uh, I understood it. So, um, and had to seriously consider what that meant. And of course, in discussing it, well, I wasn't raised by my birth father, wasn't raised by the family. So are you really their child? Okay. And, and the child, I guess, has lots of different definitions to folks. So even with those kinds of things, I still wasn't sure that I wanted to pursue my Greek citizenship and and establish the connections with Greece and and continue to uh, uh, travel there as often as we did. Um, those statements and a couple other things uh, kind of drew a stop to my process of, of obtaining the necessary paperwork to uh, to interact with Greece and establish my citizenship. But then the HEPA became very, very much a part of my life when I retired. And the HEPA, the Hellenism portion, I'd always had those strong feelings to do anything and everything that supported Hellenism. And I still feel that way. So I'm um, very supportive of folks at least having the opportunity to make the connection. Folks having the ability to go back and establish their citizenship if they want to. And the fact that there are processes out there that make it more difficult, more challenging. Uh, the fact that it's difficult to get appointments hard to get papers, hard to get documentations. That's an impediment to that process. And that shouldn't exist that way. It should be a decision that the individual that was born in Greece and has Greek parents, they should be able to make that decision without having to uh, battle, if you will, the government and the bureaucracy on, on uh, whether that's the right for them or not. So that's kind of my view. I, I definitely agree that we need to make the process easier to make it available to folks. It's important for folks to know their heritage, to know the, the family genealogy, to know their, their family um, history, medical history, et cetera. Um, and that's why I'm, I'm more than happy and, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this panel and express maybe a little different view, a little more personal view rather than the technical view that many of the others have on this panel. So Lou, thank you very much for inviting me. <clears throat> Chris, th thank you so much because um... Some of the things you talked about are, you know, to many, many uh, Hellenic Americans who are here in the United States who have similar feelings. Yep. They include your discussion about language. Yep. They they include your your discussion about why, you know, why should I get, you know, my Greek citizenship, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I've had some of those feelings myself. But 
and there was no reason in my in my case, even though I was born in Greece, there was no reason in my case to to get Greek citizenship. What what was it going to do for me anyway? But it, there came a point where I wanted it as a birthright. That's in other words, that thing became extremely important to me. I'm a Hellenic person. I should I should be able to get my uh, my citizenship, and I don't want to dwell into it. But it took years, even though I have all the connections that I could have done it very quickly. <laughs> I wanted to do it the old-fashioned way, the way a normal person would do it, That's and it's correct. and it's amazing how they don't want you to become a Greek citizen. It's amazing what type of roadblocks they put in in front of you. It's just it's just absolutely amazing. In terms of the language, I will say I will say one thing. When when a father says many times, then you saw yours, etc. It's it's not it's not it shouldn't be translated the way you may imagine it as an, as let's say a Hellenic American or as an American. It's a little different. These are the type of statements many times that a father makes to a son. I would not take that I would not take that super seriously, even though it disturbed you. I would I would be very careful with that because sometimes people say things, and like uh, you know, there's an old saying or proverb about you know once the arrow leaves and hits something, it can never be taken back and all that. I got that, but just but just think about that, and thank you, thank you for that presentation. It was certainly from the heart, and and uh, that's the, that's the way we took it. And I did. Uh, I think we have to do something regarding the, the language. That's a separate issue, True. but I think we have to have that discussion uh, also to improve language language abilities in in the diaspora. But a separate it's a separate discussion, which I'm going to have anyway in, in the future. Our that's next, true. thank you, Chris. Thank you for everything. Our next uh, presenter is uh, uh, Petros Diplas. Uh, Petro is from Kefalonia Island in Greece. And for nearly 50 years, he has been dedicated to the two most powerful pillars of Greece, the Diaspora Hellenes and the Maritime Hellenes. Currently, he serves as the host of our Global Voice on the Voice of Greece radio under the Hellenic Broadcasting Corporation, or what we know as ERT and is the editor-in-chief of the Maritime Publication, Shipping and Financing, and Finance. For many years, he has held key positions in Greek and foreign media, including newspapers, magazines, TV stations, and has been an expert on social affairs to the European Commission. I had the pleasure of meeting, of meeting uh, Petro years ago, a few years ago, actually, when we when we had the 10th anniversary of the Liberty Ship, which is a museum now in uh, in Athens, I did an event in Greece on the Liberty Ship on the 10th anniversary with with the shipping community, as you know, as you know, uh, Petro, and uh, it got it created a, a very big buzz within within Greece because it was many people mentioned that was one of the most major diaspora events in Greece itself. Anyway, Petra, thank you for being with us. And whatever language you want to speak is fine with me. Speak <laughs> in English, speak yeah, in English yeah, whatever yeah. you want to do. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have to speak in English, so most of you will understand better. Uh, I will try at least. <clears throat> now, I thank you very much, Lou, for inviting me. And um, you said something which uh, I, I like that very much. Uh, I, uh, the only thing that makes me happy is to deal with things that the Greeks are doing better than any other one. The, the diaspora Greeks and the maritime Greeks, the shipping sector of Greece, is uh, is no match to anyone. It's 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 something that makes you proud of their successes. The diaspora Greeks. And the Greek, because uh, for 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 many years I was dealing with the economics in uh, the domestic economics, and I can tell you there is nothing more frustrating than to see the 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 exact the other side of the code. Instead of seeing successes, you see only failures. I mean this. Um, uh, I can't explain it, but it's it's so sad. When you see that the Greeks abroad 
are doing so well, the Greeks on the oceans are doing so well, and the, on the contrary, in within Greece, domestically, they are doing the worst things you can think of in all sorts of ways. Uh, we are a bank bankrupt country in economy with the most entrepreneurial, strong uh, people on earth. It's, it's amazing. You know, uh, as Lou said, you, you cannot explain. I myself, after so many decades dealing with economics, I can't explain why. The only thing I can think of is that those people that they, 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 they govern Greece, they rule Greece, they have the power in Greece, they don't want to lose it. They don't want competition. So, so they make bureaucracy and all other things that will, will keep all the, 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 the successful people, the, 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 the better people than them, in, uh, not to come to Greece, not to, to, to have a chance of, of doing any successful thing, because that will put in danger their own uh, being in Greece. I, I think you understand why. I mean, this is the conclusion. I, because, I, for instance, um, the Greek Americans right now and the, the diaspora Greeks, or, or what Greeks have managed in our national issues, uh, 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 doing f with Turkey and other, it's not because of our Greek government and of Greek ministers. It's because of the Greek, um, uh, I would say, the elected Greek politicians in all states in 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 uh, in United States, in Australia, and in other countries. It's our really real strength that that keep Greece to have a geopolitical uh, statue, a geopolitical in, in the geopolitical uh, uh, power fighting uh, to, to, to be so well uh, positioned. Otherwise, it's not because of our politicians, it's because of the diaspora Greeks only. And about um, entrepreneurial successes, you must know that uh, 300 Greek ship owners have made a miracle in the last 50 years to become the first ship owning community in the world, much better than uh, Japanese, than Chinese, than anyone. Today, when uh, Britain, uh, the United Kingdom was uh, ruling at the sea, having 30% of the ships in uh, 60, 70 years ago, now the, the, the shortest joke you can tell is a British ship owner. There is none. Can you imagine that? There is none British ship owner. And the Greeks, which nobody helped them, they have made that miracle. They, they own more ships than any other nationality without anyone to help them. It's just their hands, like the Greek, the diaspora Greeks. Because I don't think that the Brazilians want to, to help the Greek entrepreneurs or the Americans want to help the Greeks. It's the, it's, 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 it's the, 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 the capability of, of the Greeks that made them. I don't think that anyone wanted to, to, to help Katsus to become an entrepreneur in the United States. No. So what he became was meritocratically, was axiocratically, was because he entered the competition and he succeeded. While all, nearly all the successful Greeks, the successful Greeks in Greece are not successful because of meritocracy, but because of, as you call it, chronic capitalism. It's because you know someone and he helps you. It's nothing meritocratic. Now, having said that, uh, so what I do is with the, the uh, voice of Greece, with our global voice, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, um, I would say, it's, I'm very happy and uh, it's my best time of the day to hear successful Greeks or Greeks abroad in 150 countries to tell their story, how they went there and how they became successful. And also to talk with uh, Greek ship owners because they all have a very good story. Now, Going to the adoptees, I didn't know that they were, I knew that they were babies, Greek American, uh, Greek babies adopted by American or Greek American families, but I didn't know that there were 4,000 of them. 
Um, because of the books of um, God of Einstein of Mary Cardaras, I found out about these matters and we've hosted at least five Greek Americans and one from uh, Netherlands that uh, their story was so moving. I, I can tell you that uh, in most of the cases, I cried. I couldn't stop my feelings. Uh, and uh, when it all, it all came to, they wanted to be Greeks, to, to have the, the, the Greek nationality and to have Greek pastors. And I can really, uh, I really understood what difficulty is to overcome the, the Greek bureaucracy. I mean, nobody can understand them. It's uh, understand it. I mean, all other nationalities. For, uh, 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 Lou, you said something about going to Lebanon. I mean, you can't imagine how easy it's for a Lebanese that only his grandmother or his grandfather is Lebanese to become Lebanese. I mean, they love to to to, to make Lebanese um, uh, uh, to give national give Lebanese nationality to any anyone that is feeling Lebanese even if one-fifth of the bloodline is one-tenth of the bloodline is Lebanese. Uh, Petra, I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I, I will say one thing about the Lebanese. If you are Lebanese anywhere in the world, you have the right to citizenship and you have the right to vote in Lebanon. Signal me. Yes. Proceed. Proceed. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You see, uh, the Greeks, uh, the ethnicities that resemble the Greek, um, I would say... Uh, um, uh, in the area uh, where about, let's say, with the, 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 the great Aspera, 15 to 20 million. Well, 15 to 20 million are the Jews, 15 to 20 million, something maybe less, the Armenians. Uh, we, we, are, we have very, very a uh, lot of things in common. But one thing is not in common is, is, is the way Greeks um, uh, behave to other Greeks. It's amazing. Have nothing to do with Armenian. Have nothing to do with Jewish. Have nothing to do. With, it's totally different. We, we uh, how a Greek uh, tries to find a way to make life difficulty to other Greeks. It's it's amazing. You you cannot understand that. I mean, Greek bureaucracy. I'm dealing with bureaucracy, and and it's it's out of this world. You know, a Greek bureaucrat can help anyone within seconds or he cannot help you even if you spend years trying to to to, to resolve things and it's it's amazing it's 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 we have we are Jekyll and Hyde we have two personalities at the same time I mean some years ago when we had Olympic Airways and I was when I was young, I was seeing how a Greek hostess was behaving and how the, the, the in other airlines, well, if you were putting the button for second time, there was an angry air hostess coming to you and said, what do you want this time? I mean, and you were saying, why are they not friendly? Why are they not hospitable? But that same lady at, at her home, was greeting, I mean, her friends better than any British, any American, any German, any other. So, uh, so a Greek person, uh, if he likes to be hospitable and uh, friendly, he can surpass any other nationality. But when he, she or he doesn't, you can't imagine the most difficult people we are. I mean, we don't want to help others. It's, it's, it's an amazing, nobody can understand why we behave like that. And I can think, I can think, and I can feel what problems all those adoptees have, because I've tried through my uh, um, TV show, not TV show, radio show on Voice of Greece, um, uh, in at least 25 countries, I've talked to people of, of Greek origin trying to, 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 to have Greek citizenship and to have Greek passport. They are trying 10, 20, 30 or 40 years. Um, in New Zealand, the, the, our consul there uh, is, is telling me stories of Greeks that 
after 30 or 40 years of trying, they get their passport and they get their citizenship at the age of 70 or 80 years old, and they are crying in the, in, in, at the consulate when they receive that, because they managed to do that before dying. Can you imagine that? I mean, it's... it's, it's and, and I can think of, of the adoptees of the problems. Let's suppose there were Greeks in Asia and minor in the Ottoman Empire, in Egypt, because when they asked for birth certificates, but the, 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 their grandparent was Greek, but he was a citizen of the Ottoman Empire, but not a citizen of Greece. So, so what, what, what papers can he provide? I mean, he speaks fluent English. His, all the relatives are Greek. He was married to a Greek. But, but they cannot take the citizenship because they cannot understand why. Nobody can understand why. I mean, everybody is against Hungary. What she called the, the president of Hungary, that everybody is, uh, I can't recall his name now. And we have a Greek, we have a Greek, uh, or uh, of Greek um, uh, national uh, of Greek origin, who is a member of the Hungarian Parliament, and and he is telling me oh, how the, the the president have given a Hungarian nationality to five or six million Hungarians, and they can vote from all over the world because their grandfather or grandmother was Hungarian only, and they have citizenship and they have passports. Very easily. I mean, in, I, I, I was seeing what Goda Van Steen was, was logically saying that, I mean, being, being a, a Dutch in Netherlands, I mean, logic, despite it was, um, um, it was, uh, how should, how should I would say, discovered in ancient Athens, logic and everything was talking, and our philosophers were talking about logic. Logic, doesn't stay in Greece anymore. Logic is in Netherlands, logic is in the United States, logic is in Germany. Here is everything don't happen logically, especially when you have those adoptive issues of trying to get nationality. Um, as I was telling to me, I'm trying to, 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 to make a Greek of Greek origin in Zimbabwe, 35 years, Anna Andreoulakos. He is trying 35 years. Before 35 years as a child, 40 years, they had Greek passports. And now they cannot issue new ones because they, 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 they don't give their citizenship. And 40 years ago, they had Greek passports. It's, it's a crazy situation. Uh, I'm trying to resolve that. I've been to, to the ministries, to the, and nobody can give a solution to that. And I, I, so um, I, I understand what our adoptees are facing. They cannot understand. I'm Greek. I found that I was adopted. I was a Greek boy, a Greek girl from, uh, from uh, Greece, that I was adopted to an American family. And why don't they give me? And what God... Uh, uh, Van Steen described, it's very logical. It's, 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 uh, I mean, uh, our government must only say we have to do that law and, uh, uh, and uh, for, the, for the Greek parliament to vote for it. It's so easy. You know, in my, my 40 years being an economic um, journalist and financial journalist, I, I have seen laws in Greece to change overnight if someone strong in power wanted to change the law. Overnight, I can tell you I've seen that. Overnight change of the law. I mean, the law was forbidding that, and next day the new law was permitting that. It's, it's so fast that that uh, uh, the, the, the Dutch parliament, the German parliament, the American parliament cannot do so quickly. So things can happen in Greece within seconds, or can never happen. I'm, I'm sorry to say that, but this is my experience of uh, the Greek um, uh, administration of the Greek, uh, and you know why the Greek diaspora have uh, have uh, succeeded so well, and uh, our Greek opponents have succeeded because they don't have to go through the Greek administration. If 
And now we are ruling, uh, we, are, uh, we are number one for 50 years in ship owning uh, in the world. If our Greek ship owners had to pass through the Greek administration, through, through the Greek democracy, within six months, they would be extinct. There will be no Greek ship owner in the world. So, um, um, uh, with um, uh, my colleague, we are trying to, to, to persuade all those um, administrative in the Ministry of Interior, in the, in the Ministry of Exterior uh, and Foreign Ministry, etc., and to tell them what they are facing. They all say, yes, we understand. Yes, you, you know, um, a, a Greek uh, minister, a Greek uh, general secretary, a Greek... Uh, um, deputy minister will say, yes, you have absolute right. We have to do something about it. But, but yes, but you see, this is the law that has those difficulties, that the difficulty. And then he will uh, tell you, go to, to, to a special person of the ministry, and he will explain why. And then he he's piling up problems, he's piling up the difficulties, he's piling up the... Uh, and then you are exhausted, and then you say, fair enough, uh, now, where do we have to start? What do we have to change? And I know that all this can cha be changed within hours if they really want that. You know, in order to, 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 for, for our diaspora Greeks to vote in our elections, how oh, you can't imagine what crazy thing. You know, what they produced finally from the 700,000 of Greek origin in Australia, those that they voted was only 370 people. 370 people voted. Can you imagine that? After uh, 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 they will say, even you see, the problem is not only the parties that they said against the the, the vote of the uh, of the Greeks abroad, but also the the, the 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 parties that vote in favor of 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 the voting of the Greeks abroad. They 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 put so many difficulties in that that it was that. That it was a joke. I mean, the, the many, many um, Greek of uh, diaspora Greek tried to, to see how they can vote, and they were excluded. Everybody was excluded from that. It's it, it was a joke. We are selling joke. We talk to, to to those people, and we are laughing because of the difficulties. Now, the the the, the Greek government said, no, we have to 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 make things better. And I am sure that whatever they do, instead of, of course, uh, 500 people to vote for abroad, nah, they, will, they will vote about, let's say, 10,000. That's it. Can you imagine that? That will be the, 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 better, uh, the better voting environment for the Greek diaspora. It's, we have a saying in Greece, when you don't want to cook, you, 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 you spend the weeks of making powder in order to cook something. I don't know how to say it exactly. Uh, I'm sure to say that. I'm sure no, no, to say that. But, 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 I'm but, trying with my, with, with my radio show and with my shipping and finance, I'm trying to do to, 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 to those those meritocratic Greek, those that they succeeded through competition, to, to, to we are the only country that did not have private universities, and uh, the the and uh, we did all these um, uh, you know successes in ancient times because we had university. Um, education, the highest you can think of, and the highest. And if you co compare what you had to pay in ancient Athens to 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 be a student of Aristotle, probably it was um, uh, the 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 fees of uh, Oxford, um, uh, Harvard, and Yale put together. Petro, I think I think that. Um, thank you very much for listening to me. No, 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 no. Thank, thank you so, thank you so much for that. The, the, the thing that I got out of the conversation is they want to wear you down. They want to wear you down. In other words, you're trying to do something. They're going to wear you down. Go, go look at this ministry. Talk to this person. We can't do this. We can't do that. 
I think I think what we have to do is just go forward in a straight line. We cannot. We cannot. We it's cannot go to the go to the prime minister and go to listen, and say, listen, "Well, listen. Then, let's let's end listen. this joke." It listen. took enough. It's four thousand people. Four thousand. We have the, to make a prime, special law to overcome the whole difficulty instead of I, of of doing all this. I agree. The prime minister and all these other people, they prefer not to make changes. The changes are going to come through through you and through ah. Katerina and through other people who are going to bring out the obvious. Everything you're talking yes, about. The obvious. The, the, obvious. the problem Every, is the obvious. The obvious. Everything you're talking about, everybody knows this. Okay, everybody knows this. But I think the key is to 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 bring out the obvious and show that the emperors have no clothes. Okay, tell it like it is and keep pushing forward. With that, I'm going to introduce now Katerina Bakoyani. Thank you, Katerina, for being with us today. Katerina is, is a U.S. educated journalist with over 25 year career working in top positions for the largest Greek media organizations. A pioneer in the, pod, the podcast market, she co founded the first Greek podcast production company, Pod.Greek, which established podcasts in Greece. She is now co founder and director of Melon Media, a premium podcast production company created on the belief that sound, sound can be more powerful than visual images. As of September, congratulations, 2022, she is the head of podcast for the Alter Ego Media Group. Welcome, Katerina, and thank you for being with us today. Katerina, unmute yourself. So let, let's start over. <laughs> so again, thank you. It's my honor and my pleasure to be with all of you this evening. Um, I know most of you. Uh, like I told uh, Honda and Mary, it's been a fascinating journey with them. And I don't know how much more I have to add to all the presentations other than um, uh, my own amazement and personal storytelling. I'll start by sharing how I came upon the story, which I think is uh, very telling in its own way, uh, because I'm Greek, I'm 100% Greek. Um, I'm also an investigative journalist, and I have lived in the States for many years, yet I had no idea of the 4,000 uh, babies that had been adopted from Greece to the US. Uh, and I came upon the story um, by talking to a uh, Greek American senator in Wyoming for something completely different. And he just casually mentioned on this book and it was like a bombshell had dropped. And that was maybe three years ago. Um, the story is, of course, uh, for any journalist, fascinating. Uh, it's more fascinating that um, we have no idea or, or we had no idea in Greece. So enter Honda van Steen. She is uh, the first one to educate us on the subject, not through, uh, not only through her wonderful book, uh, but also with all the talks. Um, I don't know, Honda, how many of your talks I've, uh, <laughs> I've come, I've attended and, and listened. Uh, I think there's a reason why we in Greece don't know of the story and also why the Greek American community doesn't know of the story. Quick note, I'm also sort of Greek American. My father was born in the States in um, Oak Park, Illinois, which is where I went to high school uh, later on. So I know the Greek American community and I have um, many aunts there and cousins, um, one of them living um, a, a few doors away from Mary Cardaris. <laughs> so, and they had no idea either. So I think, um, I think that, um, the people that were involved in the adoptions, the good guys and the bad guys, I think that um, they didn't want the story to be heard. They didn't want the story to be told uh, because we are ashamed because this is a story that happened during the Cold War years. It is a story that has hurt many, many people. And it's a story, it's a, a very dark time in our history. Uh, I did uh, with Honda and Mary um, as my advisors a, a podcast 
called Born Greek Made American, and um, it's about uh, it's about two girls that were adopted in the U.S. after their father was executed by the Greek state for being a communist with uh, the more well-known Beloyanis. Maybe, um, I mean, most people have heard of Beloyanis. Uh, the girl's name was Argiriadis. Uh, so he was executed for being a communist. I think he was the, the, they were the last communists that were executed in 1951. Uh, Honda, correct me, it, it's been a while with my dates, um, 1951 or 1952? 52, thank you. No, no, it's important to get those things right. So, um, so, and, and after he was executed, um, his two little girls were adopted by a very wealthy Greek-American uh, couple family in Massachusetts. And the story did not end up well at all, not because the family was not loving, they were very loving, but you cannot erase one's past. Um, the mother um, of, um, sorry, what, the, the oldest uh, girl um, was depressed her whole life, uh, never having the chance to talk about what had happened back in Greece. Um, and her son found out uh, many years later um, that uh, he was actually the grandson of somebody that was executed in Greece. Um, all this is to say um, how uh, difficult that time period was for Greece and how many lives were affected and how we in Greece um, are not very keen about uh, talking about it. Um, and maybe that explains in part why when you go to the government these days um, and to officials high up, uh, they, they, they are not very willing to um, to talk about it. I mean, I, I think from my experience, because um, I'm a journalist, I'm not an advocate. So uh, as a journalist, though, I do pose the questions. And um, I have spoken to many officials. And my impression, at least um, up to la a year ago, um, I'm, from Honda's presentation, I'm, I'm gathering that maybe things are changing a bit maybe yes they're, they're moving towards the direction and and that's all because of the tenacity and perseverance and the logic that uh, honda and the other adoptees uh, have on their side uh, when i was investigating the story investigating the story they were in denial um they uh, the, the people i was talking to um i have to say some of them were um uh, were kind of hostile uh, that I was asking the questions, they were not sympathetic at all. It was sort of like, why do you want to stir up, um, you know, these stories again? You know, let's let let's let's forget them. Um, uh, we don't want to deal with the issues now. And, and there's another thing. Uh, I I agree with Petros a hundred percent about the bureaucracy. <laughs> we've we've I think we can all we can all. Uh, just a side story. I have a, a British friend. Um, who it took her years married to a Greek um, to a Greek man. It took her years to obtain her citizenship, and uh, she she she's a writer. She's a well known writer. Uh, she has the means to support herself. Um, she speaks Greek um, sometimes. I think better than me, and uh, she's quoted as saying that uh, obtaining her Greek citizenship is maybe the most humiliating experience she's ever had to go through. So um, yes, bureaucracy, yes. I don't know why we don't wanna, you know, we don't want other people um, <laughs> to be to, to be obtaining the citizenship, but but also also guilt. And and uh, also, um, you know, this, let's not deal with the past. Now, uh, has this story uh, been known now to the Greek public? Because that, that would be important that, that you have the Greek public sort of on your side when you're lobbying for um, Greek citizenship, when the adoptees are lobbying for Greek citizenship? I would say yes and no. Yes, because um, there's been the books by Honda and also by Mary Cardaris, um, a, a, a very moving accounts uh, of uh, adoptees. I don't know how anybody can read those accounts and, and have a different opinion uh, of whether they're Greek or whether they they should uh, have their citizenship. Uh, but so yes, there's been awareness for sure. And also um, there's been newspapers that have been writing about uh, 
this story, uh, Kathy Merini, uh, for one, I mean, has uh, through Mary, who has been uh, writing articles in Kathy Merini, I mean, front page articles. So yes, you'd think that the Greek public now would know, but no, because um, we have a short memory, you know, we'll read something today, we'll forget tomorrow. And um, also, you know, in the, in, the, in the day and age of so much information, um, you know, it's not a story. I, I know I'm going to disappoint here. I mean, it's it's a story that is very moving, but it's not a story that a lot of Greek people are going to rally around. Uh, so uh, Petro suggested <laughs> that if something, if you want something done in Greece, it can it can change um, in a day if there's somebody powerful or never, which seems to be the case now. So, yes, I mean, you, you know, we have to lobby harder um, and um, find the powerful people that are going to make it happen because it's a, it's a just cause, obviously. Um, and I know that, um, you know, the Pandora's box, it's okay. If it, it has opened. It has opened in other stories, in other cases. I think, I think it's, it's okay. We, we're ready to talk about our past. I think the podcast... Um, sort of tried to do this. Um, the, the history is being revisited uh, left and right for the left and for the right. So I think that there's nothing to be to be to be scared of. Um, now, for sure, I'm part of this campaign of telling the story again and again. I was um, honored that I was able to tell it. Um, I hope I'll be given the chance to tell it again. Um, that's, you know, raising awareness, I think, um, does help. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you so much, Katerina. In, term, in terms of the guilt, obviously the guilt is not coming from the bureaucrats and people like that. The guilt, obviously, is to the families. The guilt, the guilt may be having to do with, let's say, someone who just happened out of wedlock to have a child and was, you know, well, there, was, there was a circumstance like that. What, what I'm really trying to say is... I think it's a I, collective guilt. So, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know because to me, to me, the issue is a, is a very large issue. The issue of non of, of the people abroad who are guaranteed that as descendants, bloodline, Gonda said, etc., that they 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 should be allowed to be citizens. That there's a a very huge pushback from the bureaucracy and government of Greece not to give them the citizenship, not only adoptees, but anyone from the diaspora. And it's ridiculous, by the way, because everyone is coming abroad. They, they come to the U.S. and they're always saying, <laughs> help us, do this, do that, do this, do that, do this, do that. And we do all of that. But the reality is it's, it's not coming in the reverse. Uh, Petro mentioned that all other nations, many nations in Europe, have no problem with giving people uh, of descent from their particular countries their citizenship, and not not even not even having the same criteria as people who are in America. Let's say Hellenic Americans, like myself, born in Greece, Greek parents, going before the revolution on both sides that I can trace. No, no problem whatsoever. And I had to wait for years, for years to get my, my citizenship. Now, why did I want it? I didn't need it, quite frankly, but I thought it was a birthright. And I think the adoptees that we're talking about are in the same situation. Why are we? Why do we have a problem with, with them? Why are the bureaucrats doing these things that we're talking about? Petro was correct, and you're correct. In two seconds, they can reverse this. If I have, I have listen, I have the context. I could have gotten my passport very quickly. I decided not to do that. I could have gone to people that I knew because I had the contacts. Mm -hmm. I could have gotten it in a week if I wanted it. But no, I decided to go the regular process. And then in the beginning, in the beginning, I have to I have to say this. I was very angry that they asked for this and they asked for this. And this was delayed and this and this and this. So finally, I decided, you know what? I'm not going to get angry. I'm going to wait you out. I'm going to wait you out. Even though it took years, I was relaxed. Finally, I got it. Anyway, I apologize for jumping in on that. But this is emotional to me because it took me years. It took me years to get my Greek citizenship. 
and it pissed me off, but I was relaxed. I got it. With that, we're going to introduce Mary Cardaris. Mary, a good friend, is the director of the Demo Center at the American College of Greece in Athens. She holds a PhD in public and international affairs and is a writer, journalist, and documentary filmmaker. Mary has a very personal interest in today's program. She is one of the so-called lost children of Greece who have written numerous articles on the subject and is an advocate and activist for the human rights of adoptees. She has written a novella called Writ at the Root, the story of stolen baby Dina Pulius, reunited with her birth parents and siblings after being 42 years apart. She has been published in, excuse me, excuse me, Mary, for the, for the way this thing is spelled, Spoo Eaton Dieville in uh, Brooklyn. Uh, and you can get that book easily on Amazon. She also edited a collection of essays uh, by Greek-born adoptees. And we had the, some of those adoptees on, on a past uh, panel discussion that we had. Her own included, entitled Voices of the Lost Children of Greece, published in English by Anthem Press and in Greek by uh, Potamos uh, Publishers in Athens, entitled Fones ton uh, Jaimenon Pedion Tis Aladas. Welcome, Mary, and thank you for being with us today again. We love you. Uh, Lou, thank you for hosting us. Lou, thank you for being so emotional. Lou, we love you. And thank you to everyone who has joined Kalisperas, us from Athens tonight. Um, it, it's an honor to be with you and to be with Honda, my, my partner in the campaign, uh, Nostos for Greek Adoptees, and with Chris and Petro, and of course our friend Katerina Bakoyani. Uh, special thanks tonight also to Olympia Anastasopoulou, who is now also helping us uh, in the campaign and with our efforts for citizenship. Um, I'm going to speak here at the end, not technically, uh, but personally tonight, and about both records and citizenship. Uh, obviously, I'm here to represent the lost children of Greece as one of them, and I hope I can speak to their pain um, in many cases, uh, their sense of loss in many cases, and their sense of pride in all cases uh, in being Greek and in wanting to reclaim their identity as such through their Greek citizenship restored. Um, I am connected to several adoptee groups, not just Greek ones, and adoptees all over the world, there are millions, share so many emotional and psychological traits after being extracted from their family of origin and placed with new families in strange countries. Um, those adoptee groups, have many supporters, academics, journalists, and authors who have been by our side helping by telling our stories and helping us to tell our own stories like Caterina and Petro, and they advocate for us too, uh, the right uh, to our identities, the right to our adoption papers, uh, the right to reclaim our citizenship from where we were born and where many of us spent some years in orphanages and also in foster homes. Uh, one advocate and champion of ours is a woman by the name of Gabrielle Glazer, who wrote an important, amazing book on the system of adoption in the United States called American Baby. If you have not read it, you should. Uh, as an investigative reporter, she continues her work about the practice of adoption and the nefarious side of marketing children. Uh, I use that word quite deliberately, which is what is still happening in the world of adoption. Uh, the battle lines over abortion are tied into the narrative about adoption as well. You will be surprised to hear about what she is uncovering. She may be tuned in this afternoon from New Jersey, um, and I want to personally thank her for her compassion and for her dedication to this reporting that she's been doing. She recently attended a gathering of writers and researchers about adoption uh, and adoptees themselves in New York. Uh, we talk often, and she mentioned that many adoptees expressed that they feel like they are in exile. That image, that concept, exile, resonated with me and resonates with others I talk to as well. There is no way um, 
uh, that this negates a quote unquote happy adoption. And it does not diminish at all a situation where adoptees had happy homes in which to grow up. Uh, they are two separate things. In fact, I used to tell my own parents that they are not responsible for my feelings and emotions born of my reality as an adoptee and that they did, they did the best they could all they knew to do at the time with the information they had in handling my situation as an adopted child. When you had a past before you come to new parents and when an organization or a state wants to conceal that past from you, including medical histories and circumstances of your birth, the names of people responsible for your relinquishment or stripping you of something that was yours at the time of your birth, say a citizenship, you are in a way exiled from your life. It is unfair, it is unjust, it is imperious uh, by today's standards, it is backward and it is emotionally very cruel. Our present needs to reunite with our past so that we can be complete people. Uh, we need to know where and from whom we come. Uh, we need to know how we came into the world and why we were taken from the one we knew, if those are at all knowable. And we need to be recognized and reclaimed by a merciful, understanding, progressive state that says uh, you were once ours, uh, we reclaim you as ours, uh, you will always be ours, and, and we welcome you back to this place where your grandparents came from, where your parents came from, and where you came from. Uh, it is a recognition and an affirmation that we need. This is not a mere exercise in trying to make a point. This is a request and a requirement, and it is what we deserve uh, to have returned. Um, I did not get the chance to meet the mother who gave birth, uh, gave me birth before she died. Uh, and for me, that is so sad because I had so much to ask her. There is a chance though, uh, that my father is alive here in Athens and I would love to meet him and to find out if I have siblings. Uh, there are questions that you all, or most of you all know the answers to in your own lives. For me, it's this. Who do I look like? Um, where did I get this head of white hair uh, that started developing when I was 22 years old? Uh, where did I get this husky voice of mine? Uh, who has my eyes? Who has my smile? Um, from whom did I inherit one trait or mannerism or another? Uh, there is some light, though. You know, my life is coming into clearer view. Uh, little chips of the mosaic are being placed properly in their places. I know I was born in Ibirotisa, for example. Uh, I know now where my high blood pressure comes from and that I have to carefully monitor my heart health. I now know why I, when I get a cold and why it goes straight to my lungs where I have some vulnerability. Uh, I can take better care of myself knowing these things uh, we not we all need that kind of information, especially adop adoptees uh, in the realm of, of medical histories, which many of which probably reside in those files. My files, however, are not all mine. I have an outstanding adoption file being kept from me despite all legal efforts to attain them. Uh, I am playing by the rules. Uh, some agencies have uh, blatantly skirted theirs. Honda helped me to submit a request for the files, uh, and I was to get a response within 30 days. That was two years ago. Um, as I said in an article published Friday by Kathy Medini in the English edition, uh, this is not a political calculation. This is a human calculation. Um, a few years ago, we thought we had made some real progress. Honda and I were invited to the Maximus Mansion here in Athens, and we met with the then chief of staff uh, to the prime minister. I was about to launch into an elevator pitch for our case, citizenship for Greek adoptees and open adoption records available to all of us. Before I could even begin, 
He held up his hand and said, Mary, I, I know what this is all about. It's about nostos. Uh, and as Lou said, it comes, it comes from the ancient world and it means uh, the desire to return home, like Odysseus. The difference between us and Odysseus is that he got home to Ithaki in about 10 years. Uh, we've been adrift for almost 60, <laughs> uh, maybe a little bit more. Um, anyway, the, this chief of staff gave us the name of, of our petition campaign, uh, which is Nostos for Greek adoptees, and I thank him for that. Um, uh, Lou, I, I know, Lou, you have the, the link up, and if, if you all on the panel have the link, I would appreciate that you share it. Um, right now, I think we've, I don't know, somebody can look it up. We've gathered the signatures of over 37,000 people, as Lou said at the beginning of the program, and we intend to present the petition to the Greek parliament with a request to do something, which is to assemble a committee to ascertain identity and with the permission of the adoptees to do that, return adoption files and grant the restoration of citizenship. We would be grateful if you will add your name to that petition, share it with your friends and family, ask them to add their names. Um, I would like it shared over every continent where there's a diaspora of Greeks. Um, finally, I'd like to end talking about a person who's changed my life. Uh, Lou mentioned her um, briefly. I, I can never tell my own story. I can never talk at all without telling hers uh, 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 because telling her story in a small book called Ripped at the Root inspired me to start talking about my own and to write about Greek-born adoptees and to advocate for them. Uh, Dina Pulius, uh, who, who now lives in Florida, was stolen from her parents. Um, two people who were very much in love and who lived in a small village called Castagna in Ipiros, uh, which is a stone's throw from where my birth family is from. Her parents were not married and they were scorned for their love affair and the child they produced. Her mother was threatened with her own life and so was the life of their baby girl. She and her father took the baby for safekeeping at a place for unwed mothers. When they returned for her, she had vanished. There was no trace of her. And at that time, after two devastating wars, there was little chance they would find her. Babies were literally disappearing from Greece. The couple eventually married and had two other children. Meanwhile, Dina was taken to America. We don't know how or with whom, and she was raised by Greek Americans in the state of Ohio. After Dina had married and had twin sons of her own, a woman by the name of Lisa Corellis, I wish we could find Lisa somewhere, helped Dina find her family. Uh, they proved the relationship through DNA testing and were reunited after 42 years. 42 years. Dina's paperwork is not in order, and that is because it was either destroyed or didn't exist. This was not unusual at the time, as uh, Honda has, has attested to. But Dina's mother, Vasiliki, is alive and well in Castagna. Her brother, Yorgo, and her sister, Poppy, live in Greece. Her father, Apostolos, is buried in Castagna, and they can prove they all belong to each other. Dina Pulius should be the first in line for her Greek citizenship, and to follow should be the hundreds of others who should have the same. Thank you for your time, for this program, Lou. Thank you to the panel, and I hope we see some results um, soon. Thank you. Mary, Mary, Mary. Mary. Bravo. <laughs> Mary, let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, do you know the village in Ipiros? Uh, of, of, Lu of Dina's? No, yours, yours. Oh, yes, I do. Elatis. 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 Who is it? It's in Zagori. It's Zagori. It's, it's right. It's literally, you can see Elati, my village, from Dina's village. A lot I'm not okay. sure well, Petro exactly, but it's right we'll, near we'll, there. We'll find a lot. There. Let me ask you a different question. Do you know your your family name or no? Yes. What is it? My my mother's name was Kungulu. 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 And my, and my yes, and my father's name is Konstantinos Koletsis. 
Constantinos Colatsis. We're, we're going to find them. There are seven of them in Athens, by the way. Constantinos Colatsis. We will Kolatsis. find them. Constantinos Colatsis. By the way, just as a as, as an aside here, you know, my my birth mother was so shamed and shunned f from her experience with me that she goes on to change her identity, changes her name to Maria Papacosta. She tells yeah. no one about me, not anyone in the whole wide world. And she tells everyone that she was adopted. And that information was revealed to me by Caterina Bacogliani uh, really? a couple of years ago. It's extraordinary. Yeah, no, it is extraordinary. The the other thing is this. The other thing is this that it's it's for the adoptees. I would think it's more than just your birth parents. It's also your ancestors. In other words, your grandparents, your great grandparents. There's a whole there's a whole family history. I know many of us. I I did it. You know, you research your family. Who was you know? Well, I knew my grandfather and all these people, but. You try to find out who they were, what they were, what what the circumstances, etc. It's all part of the picture, and it's a, and it's an extremely important picture for everyone. Okay, we're opening it up now. This is an open discussion. Anybody can ask anybody any question they want, and uh, and by all means, let's let's do that. I think, I think that just talking about the issue is one thing, but but there has to be activism. OK, activism, in other words, the people in the media, et cetera, you know, link up with like you said, Mary, and like uh, some of the other speakers uh, said, link up with all the different media, link up with the diaspora also abroad, because there is a there's a big issue here. Like like course, like Petro said, you can absolutely do something if you have the right people behind you. They can do it overnight in a matter of hours. When you go and make something public many times, by the way, you go to the parliament, et cetera, and you need X amount of votes, more than 150 votes, et cetera, you have all types of positions, all types of nonsense that comes up. So I open it up. Anyone ask any questions? Um, and where, where's the next step? What's the next step, guys? Gonda, the next step. Mary. Well, I want to be on the floor of Parliament, okay, <laughs> making my case, you know, <laughs> as an invited guest. Petro, you laugh, you laugh. Although, you know, if you see people in the flesh, if you see them in the flesh, and they're they're telling you, you know, they're telling you your their story. I mean, I'm so moved by when I meet other adoptees. There were several here last summer. And there were people who had never been here. They were born here. They had never been here. They came back here. I had people at dinner and over drinks breaking down in tears, grown men breaking down in tears, so moved that they were back, you know, where, where they're from for the first time. I mean, when you meet these people, it does move you. And I'm hoping the closer we get to people in parliament, in government, we can move them also. Many uh, there will be no one would say no to this. The main thing is all these people for for to 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 decide to do uh, within a special law that will cover the whole thing and it will solve it in in a day. This in is in a it. day. This is it. Well, we know this because the chief of staff of the prime minister back then. Honda can attest to this. He said, we can, I, I said, how long is this going to take? He said, it's going to take a week to change this paragraph and we'll have it done in a month. And he pointed to the prime minister's office and he said, he wants it done. And yet, Honda, do I have that accurate, that story accurate? Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. In Greece, if the prime minister wants it, it can be done within a day. Yes. I, I, yeah. Well, they're, they're, they're busy trying to get the tourists to come to Greece. Maybe we should say, you know, that they the people who, who were from there can't go back to Greece, but open up Greece for everybody except the people who should get their citizenship. You know, we should do a campaign. We should do a, 
a travel campaign about that. We should we should go we should go to radio and TV and talk about that. Everybody's welcome except anybody who's Greek. You know, coming back, coming back from the diaspora. In particular, the adoptees. We say in particular the adoptees. They don't they don't want the adoptees there. Um, Chris, you've been smiling. Uh, what what kind of thoughts are going through your mind uh, as you're listening to some of this conversation? Uh, just so many similar stories and similar interests. Uh, the 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 motivation is there, the efforts there, the desires there, and then the the roadblocks to keep throw, throwing up and and challenges that are before people. And and it sounds like such a simple fix that it's so <laughs> difficult to get to the end. It's kind, of, it's, kind of, it's kind of dopey. But I'll, I'll tell you, we have uh, uh, gone a long way. I remember a few years ago, Gonda, when we started to have these conversations, uh, it was it was a completely different conversation. I think that a lot of work, you, you Mary, and, uh, and all the adoptees have done, have, have done so much in terms of getting the word out. Certainly the media has helped. I, I remember Gonda meeting you uh, you know, at the Grand Britannia, we were talking about, you know, what, what can we do? And I, I remember telling you, when you were talking about politicians, this and that, I said, the politicians are not going to listen to you. The only thing the politicians are going to listen to is that they see it in the media and the media starts talking about it. They, and they look, you know, like a little bit foolish or they look like they're not doing the right thing. So I, I think I think it's proceeding in the, in the right way. But I think it needs, uh, uh, continues to need a push continues uh, to need yeah. the media to be on top of it. Um, Gonda, I'm sorry, yeah. you, were, you were gonna say something. I mean, I've over the, over the many years now, I've been at it for 11 years. I cannot, I, I very much want to emphasize that these people don't approach Greece as if they're beggars. As I mean, these people have everything to give. The diaspora has everything to give. These are successful people who've built families, careers. Uh, I mean, I look at the, the, the room here and I see people who have assets to bring to Greece. Uh, and that, I mean, that not only in terms of qualifications, I mean that in terms of how they They've built their lives, how they've built their families, and they have every desire, talk, talking economic benefits now, they have every desire to spend more and more time in Greece, uh, you know, doing, doing the kind of mild form of tourism, taking their children, grandchildren, spending money. This is... If, even if you only consider the economic benefits, this is such a win-win situation. Letting people come back who actually don't even ask for anything that they never had. They ask for something that they always had, but it needs to be dusted off and restored. I've, 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 done, I've, I've, done, I've done a few panel discussions on doing business in Greece, by the way, and I've had all types of panelists. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was asked to, to moderate a panel with uh, three billionaires you know, Hellenic American billionaires. And I'm not going to name names, but they're people that I know, by the way. So I was asked to do a panel doing business in Greece, blah, blah, blah. Before before, before uh, we, we went into the discussion, I said to them, are any of you doing business in Greece? And all of them basically said no. One person tried to do business in Greece. He got, he got screwed, pardon the expression, and didn't want to do business in Greece. The other people said, you know what? We're doing fine over here. It's so complicated doing business in Greece. They have their own routine. They don't let you in. The laws are different, etc. And uh, and it's 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 very difficult, not only to do business in Greece, but in many cases, as Petros said, they don't want you. They don't want you. This is this is this is what we what I want to get across, uh, Petro. And I don't mind doing it, by the way, because you know I like these type of conversations. They don't want you. They don't want you to go in there and do business in Greece because they, they don't got want involved. competition. Competition is the worst word for Greece. Yeah, they, they want they want to do their own little scenarios over there because they want to keep a closed market. That's why 500,000, 500,000 have left, the, the best and brightest have left Greece to go abroad and they're not coming back. In a few years, they're going to be asking for their Greek citizenship. They're going to be asking, "Give me my Greek citizenship." The kids are going to say to them, "Hey, listen, you know we are, you know we are Greeks. You know we we should get our our papers." So this is this is a great this a great discussion. Any any questions, uh, Mary? Any questions of any of the panels? Um, no, I I have great appreciation uh, for them. Um, I guess I, I guess Chris, 
Um, I, ge I guess I can ask you about uh, the AHEPA and 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 the adoptees, and and I mean it's it's been documented that the AHEPA definitely had a role in in many of these adoptees. Um, I mean, I, I certainly it would certainly help if the AHEPA acknowledged that role, and if AHEPA publicly said um, to all of us, to all the Greek diaspora, to all the Greek adoptees, that that, that they acknowledge the role and that they will support um, the work that's going on now um, in in the fight for the restoration of citizenship and open records. Uh, you know, my, my, my parents were a Hepins. My grandparents were a Hepins. It, it's a great organization. I don't mean to put you on the spot, okay. but, but a HEPA is part of this story. Yeah. And I, I don't know if it's a HEPA as an organization that was behind the story, but individuals of a HEPA and perhaps influential individuals of a HEPA were behind that story. Uh, so from that, that standpoint, you know, uh, on behalf of HEPA, I, I can't speak that, well, I've not seen anything to substantiate that a HEPA was promoting it or doing it, but I'm sure individuals were, because uh, we, we do have many, many individuals. So I can definitely guarantee you that HEPA is supportive of this program that we're initiating here and going forward. And, and you know, when you're going to par Parliament, please share that with me. If I'm available, I'd love to join you. Um, I think that'd be great. That's great, yeah. You, you know, uh, Honda and I were in Thessaloniki, and um, uh, it was interesting because there were... Uh, happens at this talk that we gave in Saloniki and somebody stood up and said, I don't, I don't know, you know, I can't remember what he said, Honda, but basically it's like, wow, this is a great, this is a great story. You're all happy now. And why aren't you happy? And we should just leave, leave it alone. And, and um, it, it, it was an interesting moment. And then they wanted pictures with us, the poor little orphan people who were there and, um, <laughs> but but I think I think if I'm not mistaken, and Honda, you can correct me. I think there was more institutional involvement in in, in what happened. Um, and I, I again, I don't want to I don't want any I don't want to place blame. I don't want to go backward. But I think that it's important that. Am I wrong about that, Honda? Uh, no, you're you're quite right. In fact, uh, it was the AHEPA that devised the blueprint of how these adoptions from Greece would actually be able to happen. And they started talking about this in 1948, and they were the ones involved in the first adoptions from Greece. Fast forward then to about 1956, and there are quite some divisions within the AHEPA ranks when it becomes clear that some people have kind of misused the name of AHEPA to develop a little bit of extra private business on the side. And then, and then, uh, uh, internal divisions made the AHEPA as an organization decide that this is really, you know, child welfare wasn't really ever their specialty and that they should pull out of it, which they did. And that was even, uh, that was just in time because now in, fast forward to 59 and one of the former AHEPA presidents gets himself, uh, you know, associated with a scandal in the field. So by 1960, the AHEPA has washed itself clean of this, but mainly because the membership pushed against, uh, you know, against pre pre preserving the AHEPA name with absolute integrity and not letting certain people higher up do their thing, and, or, or because very many of them were lawyers, kind of develop a little bit of a practice in that matter on the side. That is documented, but it does it does kind of raise the question though. Many of our of our adoptees have paperwork, which is I have a letterhead, and it lists it lists them all addresses, names, you name it. The whole board is listed from back then. So their first inclination is to call the AHEPA headquarters in Washington and ask about the files. In fact, I think Mary tried that once, at which time they get an answer that is usually the AHEPA was never involved and there are no files. Uh, if well, there that's are why I would files, say perhaps the AHEPA as an organization was involved individual members and folks that yeah. were lawyers that, that were members of AHEPA. And, and we get that often and they, all yeah. organizations do. You have folks that are members of organization and they drop the name to benefit them individually or oh, benefit them professionally. So I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not aware of AHEPA's involvement. That's all I can say. Yeah. But, uh, but don't in any doubt case, individuals. Yeah. 
it is a good moment for the AHEPA to, to uh, re-evaluate re and see us as a dynamic group of a diaspora in joining forces on a subject that is forward-looking, meaning creating a pathway to citizenship. That's ultimately, nobody is talking about uh, reparations or anything. People are just yeah. really looking for an, a symbolic welcome, a symbolic welcome that finds the expression of a passport in, in practical terms. And and, and that is clearly a case that we can all join in, no matter at what level of a diaspora people operate. And diaspora across countries, not just in the U.S. No, uh, so I, I, I'm sorry, Gonda. I, I agree with you, okay, that, that uh, there has to be more um, input from various organizations. And we have a lot of organizations here, by the way. Uh, I, I don't want to name them right now, but let me put it to you this way. There's a lot of Hellenic American organizations that would, I believe, be very interested in joining in this particular scenario, okay, to support, to support the granting of dual citizenship for, for, for orphans who are Greek, who came here, not through their own, you know, through their own means. But I think, I think we can, we can mobilize that. And I think it's a, it's a yeah. very good idea to expand to expand the the organizations that are actually supporting this, because those organizations and uh, do in fact input in uh, in Greece. When you start seeing things from organizations outside of the country, you know, complaining about things not being done, etc., it adds it adds certainly to to the cause. I think it's very important, and I think also I hate to say this. I hate to say this. But I believe that last, the Hellenic Republic should be shamed internationally. I believe they should be shamed internationally for the fact that they are not acting fast enough on this issue. And I agree with Petro that this can be turned overnight and, uh, and uh, create the appropriate means and methods for, for adoptees to, to get their citizenship. We have to shame the Hellenic Republic, quite frankly, for not acting quicker, for using this bureaucratic nonsense to have you go over, over and over and over again, newspaper articles, et cetera. People are saying, yes, we agree with you, we agree with you. And then they go to the cafeño to drink some, some coffee. That's what we have to do. That's, <laughs> that's, my, that's my, uh, my two cents in this particular discussion. Uh, I think what I'd like to do, if we if we can, is Kat discuss... Katerina has something. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Katerina. I'm sorry, Katerina. Go ahead. Hi. Again, uh, as a journalist, I'm I'm wondering if it could be arranged for me to interview somebody in a HEPA on the record. I have to say that I've tried and tried and tried for my podcast, and finally through. Uh, my connections <laughs> that I'm going to be <laughs> meant. I'm not going to mention any names either. I was able. I was granted an interview off the record. Um, so uh, it would be great in in this. Um, you know, all together trying to do something for the citizenship to be restored. If a HEPA was on the record on the side of the adoptees, do you think that could be arranged? Well, you're putting you're putting Chris on the spot. Let me let me. I'm not going to speak for Chris. I'm a journalist. Speak, no, no, but I'll speak for Chris anyway. Okay, I was on the, mute. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, the, the only one who can speak for a HEPA is the president of a HEPA, right? Okay, right. the supreme president. So, so I'm not I'm not going to put Chris on the spot. I'm not going to set up okay. for this particular scenario. But I like the conversation. We heard what was said over here, and uh, discussions will take place. Great. Yeah. I'd and love, I, to, I'd I love to see the interview if you happen to know the Supreme President and could arrange it. Well, I do. The, the, the challenge we would obviously have is the age of the person. There was probably no one alive that was uh, had firsthand knowledge of what was going on at that time period. They would be in their, what, late 80s now, or early 90s. Um, you know. Right, but there's other people that, that were in there. Um, again, I, I hate I hate to do this, but it's it's my it's in my nature. There, there's other people that were. Uh, <laughs> sorry, you invited me. No, there's no, other, no, 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 no. It's it's, it's okay. Here's, here's I'm just I saying that say. there's other people. You know, like when I was 20 years old, um, and again, I mean, it's fine. You know, um, 
your part, not, not, not you personally, when one is part of an organization uh, and when you're in your 20s, you sort of know what's happening with the people in their, that are in their 60s. Um, of course, it's always individuals. Of course, it's not the whole of an organization. I mean, like in the media, I don't want I mean, the newspaper I'm working. I mean, there's some journalists I'm not his, going his, proud his, to no, associate with I understand, with but that 20-year-old yeah, now is going to be age eight. eight. So. Here's, here's, here's what I think, because I was for a few years until until this year, the National Hellenic, uh, you know, HEPA right. uh, Cultural Commission chairman. Chairman. Mm -hmm. there, there's no there's no one that you're going to find that will be able to discuss the particular details because of the age differential. We're talking about the 50s and the 60s. I, that that I am more than sure, of, by the way. However, mm -hmm. however, I will say I will say one thing. That to Gonda's point, and I think it's true, the history is there. Gonda has it in her book. It's it's on the internet. So to to go back into the history to discuss things with people that really don't know the details, including I hate to say this, I'm not going to speak for the Supreme President, but I'm not here for HEPA. I'm here for Emka. The Supreme President will not know what what you what you're even talking about. Right. But forget, <laughs> but forgetting about that for a second. One thing that I think is positive, okay, is is exactly what was discussed by Mary and others, which said it would be great, not only for, you know, a HEPA, but other organizations, but let's let's say a HEPA, it would be greater for a HEPA to say, yeah, we're, we're behind all this and we want to support it. I think I think that's a positive scenario. The other stuff, because because Gonda has the research, I've read her book, she's got the details. I went into the internet myself because because she came to me a few years ago. You know, I'm guilty. She came to me a few years ago. And she said, Lou, blah, 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 blah. Well, look at this. I'm getting dizzy. And then I started to research. I started to read her book, et cetera. I got it. I got, I got, I got the whole thing. And then when I started to do some of these uh, panel discussions on, uh, on the adoptees, I had to I had to forget about even mentioning Apple, quite frankly. I just I just said, this is Emka, which is true. This is Emka. So... Uh, I think, well, I think we, but Lou, yeah. forgive, forgive me for just a second. W what I think Katarina is saying, and it's fair, is that at, at some point, it, some in the leadership of AHEPA now have to speak for what happened. You know, you make a statement, what happened. Maybe you read Honda's book, you go through the records, whatever, and you make a statement for whatever happened back there. Ahepa is profoundly sorry. We completely support this movement. We'll do, you know, we'll put our muscle behind it. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you Mary, Mary, is, Mary, I'm not disagreeing with you. All I'm, all I'm saying is sometimes it's a matter of approach. Okay. So let's yeah, say yeah. we go. Let's say we go to the Greek government. Let's say we go to the adoption agencies. Let's say we start fighting with them. All of a sudden, you know, all of a sudden there's a blackout. So. All, all I'm saying is it's great for from a historical perspective. You know, we can read Gonda's book. We can look at the Internet. We can look at all these different things. I understand that somebody wants somebody to say they're guilty or whatever. But not I, guilty. No, no, no. Not I, guilty. No, no. But Mary, you, you acknowledge the history. You acknowledge it. Well, That's history. History speaks Mary, for itself. An individual has to have personal knowledge themselves in order to, to come forward Mary, with that kind of a statement. And, we, and Mary, I, I'd say we'd have trouble finding that person. <laughs> anyway, this was such a fascinating discussion, by the way. This but Mary, I, I hope I, I acknowledge I'm willing to stand with you and go to Parliament. I mean, that, that's supportive mm -hmm. of this entirely. So I hope Chris, I I'm taking you. I'm taking okay. you with me to Very Parliament. Good. She's going to hijack you, man. Next time you go, <laughs> you, next time you fly to Adam, she's going to tackle you. She's going to be at the airport waiting for you. <laughs> okay. Bring you right to Parliament. Anyway, we may travel together. What the heck? <laughs> this is this has been a fascinating discussion, uh, quite frankly, and we'll continue it. Obviously, we've done it before. We'll do it again. We'll go deeper and deeper and deeper until we finally get what should be done. As Petro would say, you know, if you're Greek abroad, you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a foreigner abroad, you have no problem whatsoever. They'll make you Greek any day of the week. Anyway, I'd like I'd like to wrap it up by just having some final thoughts from uh, from our panelists. Chris, do you want to start uh, to some final thoughts? 
Oh, absolutely. You know, the, the information that's shared is obviously important for, for many, many folks. And um, there's some new information I learned today. There's obviously some books that I need to read that I haven't as well to obtain uh, some more information on on history of, of all of this and and perhaps even the history on AHEPA. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll uh, commit to doing that so I can learn, learn a little bit more about it myself and be uh, well prepared. So when we do go to Parliament, uh, um, I'm, I'm informed and uh, ready at that point. So I just want to thank you, Lou, for doing this. And I, no, I no, no, no. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Hopefully, hopefully the uh, the prime minister will get the message that the that the diaspora is ticked off. The diaspora <laughs> is ticked off. Uh, and we want action. We want action on this. Gonda, uh, some final thoughts. I have uh, thoughts of a totally different nature. Uh, my husband was yesterday looking into young men killed in the Vietnam War. So we find this young man, Eric, and, and you read the description, Lynn, Massachusetts, 18 years old, and I dig a little deeper, guess what? Came over as a Greek adoptee at age five, killed at age 18 in Vietnam. I, I oh, just, wow. wow. Do, we, do, we know, know, do we know the name? Do we yes. know the name? It just kind of hit me, and and knowing that well, this is important. Children... This is important for for the for the. This is important for the cause and for him. It's yeah. very important that we all know this. And as a matter of fact, articles be written about this. This is very 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 important. He didn't live to see. He had come at age five. He didn't live to see age nineteen. All the paperwork says, of course, that they're sending him to a country for better opportunities. Killed in a in a, in a war. I mean. You could think whatever you want about the Vietnam War, but a war that certainly wasn't his at age 18. Greek do we have his name, Gonda? Do we have his yes, name? Yes, we do. That's Can we yes. say his name? Oh, sure, because there's newspaper articles about this. His name is Eric Fisher. Couldn't be more American, and he himself couldn't be more Greek. Oh, thank, thank, you, for, thank you for that. That's very important. Uh, Petra, some final thoughts. Well, I would say my final suggestion. We all go to the prime minister's office. And back and, on the door. Boom, boom, boom. Yes. And, and, and I can tell you, this is my experience, that if he will call someone that knows the laws and say, tell him, what do we have to pass from the parliament in order for this thing to happen uh, as uh, uh, quickly as possible? And then we will have the answer and everything can be done very easily. Yes, I we're, we're, we're looking I for you. That. We're looking for you to 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 have a few discussions on this on the air. We have to discuss yeah. this over and over again. Do we have your Do we have your blessings to do that in your radio program? <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> the, the thing is, that wherever we have gone to, he said, "Yes, you are have absolutely right." You are we absolutely have, right. You are absolutely Everybody right. is. It's very positive. The thing is, who is the right person? And the right person in Greece, if uh, the only person that can solve any problem very fast is the prime minister's office. Here, here's what I have to say about that. There is I mean, a... in order to understand what is the power of the Greek prime minister, is as if in the United States, the president, the Congress, and the, the, and the, Sen and the Senate decides to, to for someone to have the same opinion, all three of them. Well, is the prime minister. Here's what I have to say to that, Petro. This is my, my opinion, okay? We know that the bureaucrats know that prime ministers come and go, okay? So the bureaucracy still plays a role regardless, regardless of the prime minister. We know that, Petro. Well, yes, you know but that. It's, it's a tiny issue for to be solved. It's it is not very, big. It's very, it's, a, it's about the adoptees. It's, 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 it's a small population, very small population. So there will be no, 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 no one is going to say something negative about it. No one. Petro, Petro, Petro. It's not, it's going to be about the adoptees. And then the next thing will be, what about the other million or so other people in the but diaspora? But adoptees is something unique. It's something. No, it is. It is. You're absolutely it's correct. It's nothing to do. It's, it's something, it's very sensitive. It's, it's heartbreaking. No, you're absolutely correct. <clears throat> Katarina, we know that you're trying to get these interviews now. Uh, some final thoughts, some final thoughts on the, uh, 
uh, for for this discussion. <laughs> well, I just think that what uh, Honda said just attests to the power of storytelling, um, which is why I'm trying to get. Um, I would say all sides. I I'm, I really don't want to be misunderstood. I don't think that they're necessarily villains on one side and good people on the other side. Uh, at least from my experience, this is not the case. Even I think adoptees themselves will attest to that. I mean, um, it's it's life and it's how life was. So um, I, I don't understand why people in Greece will not talk about it or people in America will still not talk about it. Um, and as long as we don't talk about it, it's harder to be solved. And I do not share Petra's optimism uh, that it will be solved uh, very soon. Uh, I think um, people know. Well, I said it can be solved can, very yes. soon. It can. Okay. It okay. can. Will it? Is a Let's, hope. Issue. Let's hope. But we're going to push, guys. We're going to push. Um in terms, in terms, I got, I got to be honest. I got to say a few words before I introduce Mary for some final thoughts. Uh, Gonda, your, your book is, is extremely interesting. Uh, I launched off onto all types of deep scenarios in terms of the participants. I even have photos. I even have photos yeah. of the participants that we're, that we're talking about. Uh, I even had the court case, the court case of the participants. I mean, it's all it's all on the internet, by the way. It's all it's it, it's all it's all there. Uh, Mary, some final thoughts uh, for today. Lou, haven't I said enough? But I will. No, say you this. haven't said enough. We want we want some final words from you. Final final words. Uh, the petition is at thirty seven thousand six hundred and eighty signatures. We need fifty at, the, at this moment. I really would love to get to 50,000. And will. so I'll just, I'll make another appeal to spread the word and to sign the petition, please. We're going to get to 50,000 and then we're going to head towards 100,000. And then we're going to start applying pressure and we're going to do all types of things. Thank Listen, you, Lou. This, this has been, this has been a, a wonderful discussion as always with you about this topic. Um, We'll do it again, obviously, as we go along every few, you know, we do this, we do this every six months, a year or what have you, but we'll follow this particular thing because we're not going to let go. They're not going to wear us down. They're not going to wear us down. Uh, so thank you. You're, this has been a fantastic panel. Uh, for those in the audience who are listening, uh, join us in Athens, actually, with, with Mary. Uh, on March 21st, we're going to have a live panel discussion. Yes, yes which is called Yanis Kapodistrias, the governor and the making of the Hellenic nation. So this is gonna be at the Demos Center on, uh, on uh, March 21st. It's going to, the doors are gonna open, I think Mary at 6 p.m. We'll have some cocktails, etc. cetera. The, uh, the actual panel discussion will start at uh, seven. Uh, I'll moderate it, we got a great panel. There's a movie obviously being made uh, on Kapodistrias which is being filmed right now. And the film director, Yanis uh, Smagardis, will actually be there also. Also, uh, some other very famous and well-known people in terms of Kapodistrias, who's another person that was, all right, he was in the Ionian Islands at that time, he was in the diaspora. Anyway, he went there to do something good. And what did they do? They assassinated him. So, but <laughs> what did they do? They assassinated him. Anyway. So that's one one uh, one uh, thing that we're going to be doing live in Athens, and then on the twenty fourth we're going to have another panel discussion, uh, and this is um, uh, in March again is uh, Women's History Month. So we're going to do Hypatia or Hypatia, Hypatia of Alexandria, Martyr for Philosophy, and that's going to be a fantastic panel. Also, we're going to have some of the greatest uh, people who have written about Hypatia. Both for the from, from the scientific side as well as the philosophical side. Thank you all for being with us, and uh, we will see you soon in Athens with Mary. Join us March twenty first. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Lou. Thank you, Lou. Thank, thank, you, thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank Good you. night from Athens. Bye. 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 Bye